morning. Happy Wednesday. We're going to get started. Our first presentation this morning is Dr. Lydia Sauer. She's going to give us a presentation on clinical advances in fluorescence lifetime imaging and ophthalmology. Let's welcome her. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you for the introduction. Does it work now? Perfect. These are my financial disclosures. And since it's very early in the morning, I would like to start with this picture that I took a couple years ago. And when we look at it, we see what's going on. We see it's a gecko that's just hanging out there, enjoying its day. But do we really see all the information that we could possibly see? Or does this give us a much more detailed view of the picture? In the same way, we are very used to looking at these images in ophthalmology. This is a typical fundus out of fluorescence intensity image. But when we look at FLEO images, suddenly we get a much more detailed view. And I'm going to go a little bit further. This is a healthy eye. But I would like to look at some diseases. So here we see an eye with drusen due to macular degeneration. And we are very familiar with these pictures. But when we look at the FLEO, we suddenly get a completely different view of this picture. Or I have one more example. This eye almost looks healthy when we look at it. It's very difficult to delineate any pathology in this eye. But when we then take the FLEO and look at it, suddenly we clearly see something that we didn't see before. So this is what my talk is going to be about. It's about FLEO. FLEO is a novel imaging technology that was developed by Heidelberg Engineering, or developed uh, in Jena and then produced by Heidelberg Engineering. The devices look very similar to the regular Spectralis OCT, but there's a lot uh, more going on in the device. And it actually provides us a very high contrast uh, picture of the back of the eye, and we can really delineate different uh, information about fluorophores uh, within the environment. And when we think of fluorescence, I'm just going to go back to the basics for a very brief moment. Um, we can think of three dimensions in fluorescence. The first would be the spectral dimension. So when we think of the chemical view of things, the emission spectrum and the, the absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum are different in the fact that the emission spectrum is shifted towards longer wavelengths, which we see right here. Um, when we come from an ophthalmological background, we always think of the brightness dimension first, because that's what we're most used to, to the fundus out of fluorescence intensity images that just show us how bright do the flow force come back. And what I would like to focus on today is really the third dimension, the lifetime dimension, which essentially tells us how long do the fluorophores glow? So how long does it take for the fluorescence to fade away? And for that, there's a very uh, nice uh, little presentation that Chantal, a good friend of mine, made. And I would like to show this to just highlight it a little bit more. So when we think of fluorescence, we count the fluorophores that are coming back. It doesn't really matter when they're coming back. Some come back early, some later. But really, what we're looking at is how bright are they? And this is our typical out of fluorescence image. When we look at FLEO, we give these times a color. So the fluorophores that come back first, we uh, put in red color and say this is a short lifetime because they're coming back much faster. And then as time passes, we shift to longer lifetimes, and the lifetimes turn to blue color. And this essentially transforms the out of intensity image to the lifetime image. And we think that we get more information, because uh, in intensity imaging, it's dark at the fovea and dark at the optic nerve, whereas in FLEO images, we can clearly see differences between these areas. How it works is we have a 473 nanometer laser. It's a pulsed laser that we send into the eye together with an IR laser for eye tracking. And then we collect the fluor fluorescence that is coming back, but we actually split it up according to the wavelengths of the fluorophores into two spectral channels. So a short spectral channel from 498 to 560 nanometers, and then a long spectral channel from 560 to 720 nanometers. And this essentially gives us, with one two-minute measurement, these four images. So two out of fluorescence intensity and two out of fluorescence lifetime images. And when we think of healthy eyes, we always see the same pattern in these eyes. We see that there are long lifetimes at the optic nerve. 
which are depicted in blue. And I actually added those curves to it. What you can see is the curve is much less steep. So it takes much longer until the fluorescence comes back. The intermediate lifetimes that are depicted kind of an orangish greenish color that can be found all across the fundus are caused by the retinal pigment epithelium and the lipofuscin. And the short lifetimes in the center of the fovea are caused by macular pigment. And the decay of the fluorescence is really steep. So going from this healthy eye and looking at the variety of different diseases that we can look at in ophthalmology, we clearly see that there are a lot of patterns that we can map out with FLEO that really look different from another. And I would like to go through a few of these diseases today just to point out really the highlights of what we think is uh, where FLEO is really beneficial. And the first thing that I'm going to start with is uh, the whole question about macular pigment and how can we see that it's really macular pigment that we're imaging. And I want to start with albinism because patients with albinism do not uh, have any macular pigment and they also do not have a foveal depression. And when we think of, uh, or when we look at the FLEO images, we see that the short lifetimes in the center are just missing. So we cannot see them uh, because they're absent. And we did some more studies looking at macular pigment, for example, in macular holes, in MACTAL, in other diseases, and we really were able to uh, find out that the macular pigment is really causing these short lifetimes in the center. And the first disease that, uh, or the second disease that I'm going to hit on is macular degeneration. It's a very common disease that we see in retina clinic all the time. And as I showed in the beginning, uh, we really see this ring of blue uh, that is a shift towards long lifetimes around, uh, around the phobia, and we do not see any uh, indication of this in the outer fluorescence intensity image. We see this ring in all patients with AMD, which is pretty striking, and we also did some statistics on it. We kind of produced a grid onto the back of the eye and looked at the area of that pattern, which is basically uh, this ring right here, and we compared the lifetimes not just between AMD eyes and healthy eyes, but also between AMD eyes of different stages, because we think that pattern actually progresses as the disease progresses. And we were able to find a significant difference for this pattern, whereas there was no significant difference in the fovea. And that really indicates that something must be going on in this area uh, right here where we see that pattern. And it could be a deposition of something, for example, some bisretinoids or sub-RP deposits, but it could also be a metabolic change that we see. Because when we actually looked at our healthy group, and this is kind of interesting, that about 30% of our healthy subjects that were age-matched already showed a trace of that pattern. And we think that these patients, these patients were, uh, a lot of them were of risk to develop macular degeneration. And we think that with FLEO, we might be able to see the first changes of this in the eye even years before macular degeneration is developing. So we're trying to do more analysis, analysis on this to really understand it and especially follow up measurements. And we also looked at neovascular AMD. We found the same pattern. But what we saw is that sometimes in neovascular AMD, the pattern is a little disturbed, especially when we have pigment epithelial detachments that are quite large. And we did a study just kind of looking at different PEDs. And we found that hemorrhagic PEDs had the shortest lifetimes, indicating that it might be blood that we see that has short lifetimes. And for that, to kind of prove it, or kind of give another uh, argument for it, we had this very interesting patient that presented with a fibrovascular AMD and came, up, came to the office two weeks later with a new hemorrhagic PED. And what is really striking is how the red, oops, about that, how the red in the center really increases. And we actually took his blood and did an ex vivo measurement of the blood, which you can see right here. And if we put the colors exactly to the FLEO image in vivo, you see that the blood is just completely wet. But if we increase the contrast a little bit, we can see that especially the erythrocyte sediments have the shortest lifetimes, which just helps us understand these pictures a bit more. And another disease that we are really excited about is macular telangiectasia type 2, or in short, MACTAL. It's an inherited retinal disease that was initially believed to be pretty rare, but we keep finding more and more patients with this disease. 
And it was initially believed that it kind of starts between 40 and 60, but we keep finding younger patients that also have MACTEL. And it's fairly difficult to diagnose it with some imaging modalities uh, just by looking at the fundus because it can present similar to a lot of other diseases, especially AMD. So many patients have been misdiagnosed with AMD um, and it's really valuable to have a tool that really well lines out that this is MACTEL. So in patients with MACTEL, we see this prolongation of lifetimes at the temporal site of the fovea in all of the patients. It can sometimes present also as a wing. And when we compare different imaging modalities, we can really see that we can see MACTEL much better in, um, in FLEO than in a lot of the other ones, especially in early stages. The only other modality that shows MACTEL quite as well would be fluorescein angiography, but that again is invasive whereas FLEO is a non-invasive two-minute picture, basically. So it really has an advantage here. And I would like to go a little bit further and present a very interesting family, because here in this family, the proband was diagnosed with MACTEL at age 21, and he is severely affected with a visual acuity of 2100. And what was interesting in this family is that they were diagnosed with Chakumari tooth, and his father came in in his 50s, I believe, and he had early onset macular degeneration is what it said. Um, he also did not have any arms because he had burned them off in a barbecue accident. So it was all kind of very interesting to look at that family. And by looking at it a little bit further, we realized that also the probant has some uh, peripheral neuropathy, which is the reason why the father lost his arms. So we investigated it a bit further, and we were able to find a gene, uh, HSAN is the gene mutation, but it's uh, a neurological disease that causes peripheral neuropathy, but it's connected to the eye disease, to MACTEL. So we recruited a couple more patients, and the patients with that mutation also have MACTEL. And going back to that family, the probant had two sisters. The middle sister was 26, the oldest was 28, and the middle sister actually had the mutation but the oldest sister did not. Both of their clinical images looked completely normal, but the affected sister actually showed only in FLEO changes in the lifetimes, which you can see here in the wing, that is where we can already see a trace of that MACTEL pattern, uh, which could help us treat her much earlier. <coughs> and we're really excited about this case, and this was recently published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as uh, in Retina. So if you want to learn more about that, we're really happy about that. Um, and we think that this really helps uh, treating these, or approaching MACTEL a different way by understanding the causes behind it. So we go further and look at other family members, trying to really map out which of the individuals could have early MACTEL changes, which wouldn't. And we found that very early MACTEL can present kind of in the superior area, and that some of the individuals we just called FLEO positive and others we called FLEO negative, and we will follow up on these to really see if we can detect MACTEL earlier. Here's another example of a family. The father had MACTEL, and two of the sons had FLEO positive findings. The other two uh, had normal findings. So we'll follow up on these and see. And of course, we're wondering what is causing these long lifetimes. Um, in HSN, we think it's a sphingolipid uh, disturbance in the, in the sphingolipid uh, metabolism, and we think there could be toxic desoxysphingolipids that accumulate in the eye. And when we look at other patients, we see these crystals in the eye, and they really map out to the areas of long lifetimes. We try to look at progression. These are studies that are just ongoing, but really going back to the accumulation um, of things in the eye, um, this is another patient that presented in Dr. Hartnett's clinic, and it's a 14-year-old male that had a cherry red spot. And complete normal vision, it was a, a normal health examination where they found a cherry red spot, referred the patient to Dr. Hartnett, and we clearly see in FLEO that there are very much prolonged lifetimes, especially in the short spectral channel, which is kind of similar to what we see in, in MACTEL. And looking at his family a little bit further, we actually saw that his father has MACTEL. So is this a coincidence that uh, a rare disease such as MACTEL correlates with uh, this other disease, which we later found out was sialidosis? We're still investigating that. All right, I have a few more very short diseases that I'm gonna hit on. The first one is Stargardt's disease. 
Um, what we see in this disease is uh, it's a retinal dystrophy that kind of presents with flex. And I want to draw your attention really to this spot. If we look at the baseline imaging, it's wet color, so short lifetimes. If we look at the follow-up, it shifts to blue. When we look at the autofluorescence image, there's no trace of that flag in the baseline measurement, but it is there in the follow-up. So we can see how the structure progresses. But then also, the patient reported a new scotoma right at this spot. And we can already see changes in the FLEO much earlier. So we think that with FLEO, we can not only predict uh, progression of like structural things, but also of function. We also look at retinitis pigmentosa, investigate the wings that we see in autofluorescence. We see them very pronounced in FLEO in some patients. And we're currently doing follow-up measurements. Carl Anderson has been really uh, invested in that. And we think that, at least from the first analysis, we think that the patients with the strong wings in FLEO are more likely to progress. But these studies are still ongoing. We also looked at plaque renal toxicity. Plaque renal is an anti-inflammatory drug that is used for lupus and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And the problem is that it can cause irreversible eye problems. And we really try to find out not only if we can see these damages, but also if we can see them early. So for example, this patient presented uh, in the clinic. She was on plaque renal for 20 years and had a complete normal imaging, but had some reduced contrast sensitivity, some visual disturbances. She was taken off the drug, and the only thing where we really saw a difference was really in the FLEO. And we see that in some of the other patients that are on the drug as well. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. We look at more, uh, more diseases. Uh, we have a lot more ongoing studies right now, um, and there's a lot more literature if you would like to read up on that. But in the end, it's a new dimension of autofluorescence imaging. It's non-invasive and fast. And we basically see these really stable patterns in healthy eyes that change in early stages of diseases and that then show us characteristic patterns in eyes with diseases. We think it's helpful to differentiate between the individual diseases. We think it's a suitable measure, uh, measurement method to follow up, especially on therapeutic monitoring. And it's a possible tool for early diagnosis. And in the end, we're just beginning to fully understand the potential of this uh, method. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank all the collaborators, especially Dr. Greenstein, my mentor here, as well as Dr. Hammer from Jena and everybody else who's contributed to this. Thank you very much. <laughs>